I would like you to join me in welcoming our panel members for today. Lisa Baxter, Brian Bedu, Barbara Breckenridge, Lisa Custer, and David Zacharia. Our first panel member for today is Lisa Baxter. Lisa is the founder and CEO of Blessed Kidney Connections. Lisa graduated from Empire State College with her degree in human services. She has worked in this field for 30 years and now serves as a health campaign manager. Lisa facilitates workshops while advocating for volunteering and spreading kidney awareness, education, and prevention. Lisa and her late husband Mitchell started a show called The Lisa Baxter Show, which is based on her experience of being on dialysis for 12 years and receiving a transplant. The show continues to run after 10 years. She has also written several books, including Through the Eyes of a Dialysis Patient and Melzi Takes Dialysis to Show and Tell. She has done four documentaries and three public service announcements and has also appeared on many other shows. Lisa? Hello. How was everyone? Good. I hope you. well. Well, um, today I would like um, to talk about um, the work that I have done during COVID because it has really been a challenge, but you know, we all have to be there for each other. So um, one of the things I, I felt to do was to check on the seniors and um, people that lived alone, people with disabilities. So I would see if they needed anything and try to find ways of helping them to get it. And since I was a social worker for a long time, I was able to get a lot of resources that I could post on um, the uh, um, social media. And um, I could also um, share through text, share through emails, and actually call the people and actually give this to them. Mm -hmm. um, I was also able to share uh, COVID information, how to get tested, the sites where you could get tested, um, rent assistance. A lot of people had problems with uh, their rent because they wasn't working or going out. So I was helping them to get rid of rent assistance and food assistance. Some people really couldn't go out. So I uh, told mm -hmm. them free places that the food can be delivered or that they could pick it up in some sort of way. I was also able to to um, also give out devices, have um, them to pick up devices for the children that didn't have uh, devices to, for school. That was a big challenge for a lot of families, and a lot of families uh, really needed that. I shared also webinars and Zooms on mental health, on COVID. I even did skits to to bring humor even though it was a serious thing but to help them to learn at the same time the skit got their attention so that's one of the things that um that i um was doing okay now one of the challenges i could say um was staying in excuse me i usually get cabin fever but i was able to stay in maybe about three straight months and while i stayed in what i did is i um looked at youtube and learned some things about social media or using the computer that I didn't know before. And that was pretty helpful. You know, it helped me not to go crazy or get depressed inside of the, the home and what have you. So um, I was also working from home. And then I also had to go actually physically go to work as well. So uh, some of the challenges was working in the public. So I had to, you know, glove up, uh, shield up, you know, and, and do everything, follow the rules that will prevent, you know, from catching or spreading this uh, serious disease. The uh, other thing, transportation drivers that was massless that I had, I had, um, that was hard for me. I had to speak to them because to get on transportation, I had to be masked. So I didn't, couldn't understand why they would take the mask off or not wear the mask at all to protect themselves and myself. So when they wouldn't listen, I rolled the windows down to help out. And then I also uh, had to, I spoke to them. I reminded them and when that didn't work, I, God forbid, I had to report them. Okay. Um, one of the other biggest challenges is young people in the house, young people in the house that invite friends without masks. And uh, I had to stay in my room. I had to disinfect the home. 
you know, I had to talk to them a lot because, you know, um, they're not listening. You know, they just think they they living free. And I had to talk to them and it, it just was not easy, you know, um, to get them to stop entertaining when this thing is very serious and it, it, it can take any type of life. So um, that was my challenge. But I those I did those things to protect myself. So I even wore a mask inside of the house when this was done or I just stayed away. You know, food supplies. When, when I needed to get food supplies and what have you, um, I had to learn how to order things online to get supplies, to get things I might have needed for the home. So, it, you know, whatever um, restaurant or supermarket, I was able to go online to get these things to help myself. To encourage myself, I looked out the window. I uh, sometimes sat out on the porch. I got air because it was challenging. But, you know, having a kidney transplant, I really was concerned about what I was dealing with. You know, I didn't want anything to happen to the transplant after all of this time, you know. So I had to still go for my appointments to be checked out and what have you. So I was able to still do that. But, um, those are some of the challenges that I dealt with. And um, COVID is, wasn't an easy thing, but I know the webinars were very helpful, not just to share, but to even to view myself, you know? So I worked with a lot of, of, um, of the kidney agencies also to help, help me to learn more about this, how it affects transplants and how it affects somebody on dialysis or affects somebody that's elderly. So those are the things that I've learned while doing this, you know, um, during this session and this this time of, of COVID, you know, but I learned that you with these type of things in order to prepare, you know, you have to, I had to, you know, get water, order water and, and order, you know, extra supplies because you might, you might couldn't get these things before. But there are food pantries out there as well that I still share up to this day. And um, that's what I can tell you today um, that um, helped me to get through it and that would help me to live through it and help me to help somebody else. By me helping somebody else, that really gave me a big boost, you know, mentally, spiritually, and naturally. Thank you for this time and space. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us and all of the um, the amazing work that you have done to assist other patients during this really difficult year. Um, so we will hear from you again at the end um, if there are questions and if there's time to address questions at the end. Thank you, Lisa. We will now hear from our next panel member, Brian Bedu. Brian is a 49-year-old dialysis patient that was born in the Twin Island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Brian moved to the United States close to his 18th birthday and settled in the Washington, D.C. area before moving to Florida in 2012. Um, in 2015, Brian was diagnosed with stage four chronic kidney disease and ultimately renal failure in January of 2018. Brian transitioned to home hemodialysis from InCenter in August of 2020, but remains uh, active at his home clinic as a patient advocate. Brian has also served as a patient subject matter expert with the Florida ESRD Network 7 and with CACER. He recently started a podcast titled Kidney Love, which is a podcast for patients by patients. Brian? Hang on, Brian, I'll help unmute you. There you go. You should be unmuted. Hello. <laughs> thank you. And uh, hello, everyone. And uh, thank you all for having me here today. Um, if the one thing that this COVID virus has taught me and a lot of other people is about being prepared. Uh, and I want to touch on a couple of things before I get into that. Um, the mental health of a lot of, of, of patients uh, and, and myself was primarily affected when this virus started. Because as most people know, uh, for some caregivers out there, for some nurses, doctors, and other patients, when you go to the clinic, 
It's, it's, not, it's more than just your treatment for dialysis. It's a social gathering. People in the clinic become your family. And at the beginning of the virus, when we had to wear masks, you couldn't talk to the other patient. You couldn't give them the fist bump, the hug. We couldn't share any food. We couldn't eat any food. It was, it was very difficult. But like with everything else, the human species has learned how to overcome a lot of things. And for me, you know, like I said, I'm a social butterfly, so it was really difficult. I couldn't communicate with my friends the way I wanted to, but I got over that. And along the lines of disaster preparedness, when, when you look at, at the beginning of the pandemic, we couldn't get toilet paper, we couldn't get cleaning supplies, but I had some, I had a lot. And then I realized I was a, pre a prepper, <laughs> you know, I was able, I had stuff here that I was able to share with, with some of my neighbors. And I got in touch with the nutritionist and the social worker at my clinic. And if you go on, on at least with the clinic I'm affiliated with is Fresenius on their website, they have a, a concise meal plan, a renal diet. But I, I, I strongly, strongly recommend to my friends and other patients, you know, talk to your home clinic, talk to your dietitian, have them prepare, help you prepare a specific diet for yourself in the event of emergency. Here in Florida, every year, we are faced with the potential hurricane and there's always the potential that you have to grab everything and run. So me personally, I've prepared uh, what's called a bug out bag, which has my essential foods and supplies in the event that I have to leave my area and go somewhere else. Um, it also helped me to transition to home dialysis, which you know, in the event of an emergency, you want to you want to you try to think about you think about the police, the fire, the military. They're always thinking ahead and preparing. Um, and I apologize if I'm a little all over the place. So <laughs> it's my first time doing this. Um, but as a as a dialysis patient, this 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 virus has affected a lot a lot of us in different ways. Telemed has helped us out. Um, personally, I have started my garden and I've been planting and doing different things around the house. Um, I do have a good relationship with my home clinic. So I'm, I'm allowed to come in at times and talk to other patients and to let them know that they're not in this situation alone. You know, there, there's hope out here. There's friends out here. There's telemed. Um, like what we're doing now with WebEx, you know, it's, it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of hurdles to get over, but the human species is resilient and we're constantly finding ways to get over it. And again, I want to take a minute to thank, uh, Kaser for having patient input in this process, because that's very important. We, we sometimes forget the patients, you know, they, we slip between the cracks sometimes. But um, I'm appreciative of, of everything and everyone around me. And uh, uh, sorry, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brian. Um, I know it's nerve wracking your first time you're on one of these, but you did wonderful. And we really appreci appreciate you being here with us today. Um, and we'll let you know at the end if uh, we have some questions, um, time for some questions from the group. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, thank you. Okay, we will now hear from our next um, panel member, Barbara Breckenridge. Barbara received her kidney transplant in July of 1999 after being on hemodialysis for three and a half years. Since then, she's been a strong patient advocate for the renal community of Western New York. Barbara has been a patient subject matter expert with ESRD Network 2 for over 20 years. She currently serves as, a, as the Patient Advisory Council Chair and a Divisional Board Member. She is also involved with an ESRD support group, as well as the New York State Department of Health uh, Transplant Council. As a transplant athlete, 
Barbara has participated in nine U.S. transplant games and six world games, including Australia, South Africa, Sweden, Argentina, Spain, and Great Britain, where she has won over 60 medals in track and field. Her goal is to continue to make life easier and better for those dealing with kidney disease. Barbara? Hello. 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 Let's try again. Go ahead. You may have two audio. Go. Are you called in and on a device? I'm hearing a pretty bad echo. Pardon me? You have two types of audio going right now? Um, let me, okay. One, one, Okay, how is that? That's much better. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. And I'm so honored to be able to um, speak with you today. Um, when COVID started, um, I was still working. I've worked in the renal community for over 20 years. I started when I was on dialysis, being an advocate for the patients going out into the community and educating others about the disease. Um, so when my job ended because of the nature of my job i was in the community so um my job was eliminated at that time but i tell people my job was eliminated but my passion was not so uh after after not working i uh, still had relationships with the um uh social workers the dialysis center my transplant center and the whole re renal community so uh, shortly after, um, well, starting off um, in the beginning, I was really fearful. I didn't want to go out of the house. I've had my kidney for 21 years, and I didn't want a chance to lose it because I didn't know anything about this disease. So through through uh, the iPro uh, uh, programs, I learned a lot about it and how really to protect myself and all of that. And that uh, if I did get it, it didn't mean I was going to die because there were people that had survived. Uh, COVID and lived. So when the COVID started, I was speaking with one of the social workers and um, she told me about a, an elderly gentleman that she was giving uh, him his mask for his treatment. And he asked for one for his wife and she was unable to give him one because of the shortage of the PPEs. So that really bothered me. So that night I went to social media to see if there was anyone out there that was willing to donate the mask for our dialysis patients and their families. Fortunately, uh, the response I got was truly amazing. Um, through a Girl Scout organization and some other organizations, I was able to provide uh, over 3000 masks for people um, for dialysis patients and their families uh, so that they could take them home for their families to use. So it was a great, uh, a great project. And I was so proud that so many people came forward to help us. Also, after that, um, Thanksgiving time, we decided, because I have a group of uh, volunteers that was with me when I was working, and we're still together as a group advocating for the Rena community. So for Thanksgiving, we decided to provide the, um, turkeys and all the trimmings for dialysis patients and their families. So we did a food drive and we was able to um, um, provide over 60 families uh, with Thanksgiving meals. Uh, at Christmas time, we, um, well, well, back up a little bit. Our last delivery for Thanksgiving meal, I didn't feel well. I went to the hospital. I ended up with COVID. So I was in the hospital for five days. I received the treatments and I was let out and I struggled with the with the fatigue and all of those things afterwards. I had a very mild case because I had no symptoms except for a cough. But after the treatment, the fatigue started on a lot of other things. But anyway, I got through that and then it was Christmas time and the volunteers say, well, let's do something for Christmas. We couldn't do as much, but we were able to provide um, 
15 families with uh, food, food and uh, toys for the children and gifts for the families. And that was through just asking other people and we were able to do this. So as we, as we uh, work with this food for the patients, I know the challenges of a dialysis diet. And we tried to be as healthy as possible with these meals we were giving them. Of course, Thanksgiving, we did give them some traditional things that really wasn't that healthy, but it was Thanksgiving, so they received a treat. But we realized that sending our patients to the um, regular food pantries, they were not getting what they needed. They were getting foods that would make them sick. So we decided to start a healthy food pantry and we opened that pantry in February. Um, we did a food drive again and we have such generous people here, but we were able to stock the pantry and we are now running uh, well with that, working with the social workers to uh, identify the people that um, need emergency food services. And we have a process where they can pick it up or, uh, and I know that a lot of patients have uh, transportation challenges. So we do deliver to the patients that, you know, have no other way to get them. So we've got that going well. And um, it's, um, you know, we're getting a lot of people now because, you know, people are not working and the food supplies are short. And, you know, so we are able to help a lot of our dialysis patients and their families with food. I also um, um, facilitate a support group. Um, uh, for the past 18 years, we uh, have the support group meetings once a month via Zoom. And on that support group, we are able to educate people about the COVID, about how they protect themselves, and we give them resources for whatever their needs may be, uh, whatever is going on in their life. We try to help them to address those issues. Um, and right now, tomorrow is World Kidney Day, so we've got some other volunteers that made some blankets and hats and scarves, and so I distributed those to the uh, uh, dialysis centers and asked uh, the social workers to. Uh, maybe do a, a drawing or something for the patients uh, just to let them know that it is World Kidney Day. We also were able to, um, through another organization, give um, our social workers, which was about 25 of them, a $10 gift card um, for one of our major uh, coffee uh, shops, uh, Tim Hortons. And uh, just to show our appreciation to them, uh, because we help them and they help us because they help us to identify the patients uh, that are in need. So, and a lot of our social workers go over and above and beyond to help their patients. And I feel sometimes they don't get the recognition that they need. So that was just a little something that we thought we would do for World Kidney Day. So all in all, you know, I've been able to help a lot of people. Each day I try to call someone to check in on them just to see how they're doing and if they have any needs. Um, I've attended a lot of funerals because a lot of folk that I know have passed away and just there to uh, support the families, um, you know, still protecting myself, but I just feel the need to go out and support them, especially people that I've had long-term uh, relationships with. So I just continue to um, um, help the patients and their families in any way that I can. And as I said, I've got a good group of uh, um, volunteers that help. They are as passionate as I am about it. So we get a lot done here in the Western New York area. We serve, we have eight counties. So uh, when I worked, we served the eight counties of Western New York. So now that I'm not working and we're just volunteering, we still serve the eight counties of Western New York. I'm also uh, working with, um, my transplant um, uh, surgeon we, uh, uh, on a grant to try to um, uh, get more minorities uh, educated about transplantation and, and, the, and the transplant process. So I'm staying busy and my main goal is to try and help people live as healthy as they can and be as educated as possible about their disease. So I'm just so grateful to be able to do that because they help me as much as I help them. So thank you for listening to me and um, I hope to continue doing what I'm doing for as long as I can stand. Thank you.
Thank you, Barbara. Um, and it's definitely amazing to hear all the inspirational work that you've done um, for the ESR commu community, ESRD community as a whole, as well as you know just your fellow patients. Um, so definitely, we greatly appreciate you being here with us today and sharing your story with us. Thank you. I'm honored. Thank you. Okay, we will now move on to our next panel member, Lisa Custer. Lisa has over 30 years in the banking profession with experience in both the public and private sector in Seattle, Washington. She is a subject matter expert for the National Patient and Family Engagement Learning and Action Network, Home Dialysis Affinity Group, a patient advisory council member for ESRD Network 16, a kidney patient advocate for the National Kidney Foundation, and a patient ambassador with Dialysis Patient Citizens. Lisa's dialysis journey includes in-center and home hemodialysis and also peritoneal dialysis. She enjoys being a part of improving the quality of life for her fellow patients and believes that together we can make a difference in the awareness and treatment of end-stage renal disease and in, necessary in the necessary political reform needed to protect this very vulnerable population. Lisa? Hi, good afternoon. Oh. Um, Mike, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. Okay. Um, during the time of COVID, um, how I was impacted was I, uh, at the height of the pandemic, I was then um, finally entered into home chemo, which was actually uh, a year uh, process, and it finally manifested June uh, 1st. And what happened with me is that because of the uh, suppliers and next stage equipment, they literally left uh, all my equipment in my front driveway. So uh, usually, typically, they you know set things up, the pure flow machine, um, they you know they do all that for you. So um, I and my um, caregiver uh, at that time we had to you know we had to get uh, all the tools out and and get that all started and that that was a little bit difficult because that was the transitional time when drivers and techs would come to the house and set that up and so we just had to blindly do it, uh, calling the toll-free number, calling anybody to be able to walk us through that. And that that certainly, um, I would say, was a, a barrier, but we, you know, went right through that. Uh, the challenges uh, that I had, and it really wasn't like so much of a challenge because I, I live in Oregon, you know, and it's a little bit different here in this part of the country, uh, but I always, um, and very well prepared. My adoptive mother, I'm a Native American Indian, and my adoptive mother uh, was a survivor of World War II and Hiroshima victim. And at a very early age, I learned about preparing for food uh, to the point where, you, you know, you could have about six months worth of food. That, that was never a problem. Uh, I always continued foraging for these um, toilet paper and cleaners and things of that nature. And I would uh, literally be going to about four stores a day uh, before or after my uh, treatments, which were only uh, three hour treatments at my house. And I was foraging all the time, so I never ran out. Uh, and really, I not that particularly. Um, you know, up, uh, upset or uptight about the COVID. I took the necessary precautions. I knew what I could do and I knew what I couldn't do. I am not a transplant person, uh, nor am I on the list and I never will be. And so I just, you know, kind of went along with life. Um, I'm a, a church person and it certainly reduced uh, some activities there, but uh, we've been having church live since August, reduced numbers. So, you know, that was fine. Um, because I've had some infections, I've had catheters in my chest. I was in the hospital uh, three times in three months, actually. And, um, you know, having the infections and being in the hospital, uh, 
was, uh, I think, the, the most disturbing time that I had because it was full of COVID people. But, I, t you know, they tested me six different times there, and I was completely fine. So, you know, that wasn't a problem. The other disasters that we've had here in Oregon, um, you know, we've earthquakes, you know, we had a volcano, uh, the, the storm that we had, I had 10 inches of snow and ice, you know, at that time and the power being out. Uh, is I have a, what I have is a go-to bin, a COVID bin, and you literally can go to the dollar store and, and just, you know, get all these things put it in a bin, and just stick it downstairs in the garage. I've got a 2,500 square foot home, and so I've got the ability and the space to be able to do that. And I also have, um, you know, for Cineas has a, uh, like a three-day supply. I go well beyond that um, just, just in case something happens. Uh, because of the wildfires, and I want to talk about that, the forest fires in Oregon literally encircled uh, the Beaverton area. They were all over from the coastal range down south and to the east. And so my uh, chain uh, supply, my supplies for the home hemo was greatly affected for about two weeks. Well, every time I had put in order, I always ordered more. And, you know, a couple of times I got calls from my uh, home office about that. And I just was very point blank. I said, no, I need to have these extra supplies because just in case. And that just in case happened and um, we, we were fine there. When we uh, deal with the no power, uh, I have a, a fireplace. I also have a grill. I can cook with that. Um, I have all sorts of, uh, you know, lanterns, uh, batteries. I got a whole bunch of, you know, different kinds of batteries, you know, butane. Um, the one time that I was on PD that we had a power outage for five days, and it was all of Beaverton. Um, but my church is on the same grid as the uh, city police. So I was able to uh, get in the car, go to church, warm up my um, dialysate, the, the bags with uh, warmers, and then literally I did my dialysis in the upstairs of a church. And, you know, I had to do that for several days. And that actually worked out fine. Uh, what can I say? Always have, you, you just gotta always have your bins ready and prepared. How they did it here in Oregon is they give you like a one day notice, the update, and you better have all your supplies. And I actually, how I do it is I have um, gallon baggies and I know exactly how much, um, how much I need gauze, heparin, this and that and the other, and I portion it out and I have it in there. Um, and you got everything ready to go if, if, you, don't, if you have to leave. Because if you have to leave, you have to leave in a real hurry. And uh, it's basically leaving everything you've got except the supplies you need to keep alive and have some food. And in my case, uh, dog food because I have a big dog. But, um, you know, always being prepared. And even despite that, an, an attitude has a lot to do with this. You have to have a positive attitude. You have to have that uh, survival mentality. And um, in my part of the country, it's a little bit different because there's a lot of trees, a lot of hills, it's mountainous. You know, it's, it's a whole different game than the other side of the country. A lot of people here have guns and ammunition, too, as well, to be prepared. So you always, you know, you just never know what the situation is. Now, my home therapy um, office and my old unit, they are absolutely top-notch with quality, compassionate care. And they make you feel safe. They go through the drills, and they make sure that you know how to do the drills. And, and if you're able-bodied, if you have um, – I had a, a woman next to me who was a double amputee, Mary. 
And if something happened, I would take, you know, I could disconnect myself and I can get Mary off too if I had to. Um, that was something that, uh, you know, you have to be able to do. As far as my work, uh, yes, I do represent the uh, NKF. Just recently, I spoke to Senator Merkley and Representative Von Amisi to sponsor the CARE, um, the CARE for Home Dialysis Bill and the Chronic Kidney Disease Initiative. This is the first time in Oregon that this has been introduced. Uh, I'm also awaiting uh, for a public hearing as a witness to testify for the support for Bill uh, House Bill Number 2421 for the actual uh, CKD task force. And because of the storms, they're kind of behind. And that's with the Oregon legislature. And of course, I'm with KPAC uh, with the networks, and I'm actually uh, doing research work on the health and equity of the Native American Indians. And that's been certainly enlightening right there in itself. I would say the, the, the bottom line here, uh, as far as what to do, and that's being prepared, and that we shared earlier with another gentleman before me. Being prepared and having all your stuff ready, and then just don't think about it because it's already there. Now, mind you, may, you may have some things that expire, and what I usually do is I label that on the top of the bin so I can keep my eye out on that. And just being prepared and certainly having um, uh, amounts of, you know, a fairly large amounts of petty cash. The ATMs all went down uh, when we had uh, a couple of these issues, power issues, everything went down. So, you know, you never know when you need some money. And I would just say you must have a hopeful, optimistic outlook. You can do it. You just, you just have to try and think out of the box. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lisa, um, for sharing your story with us today. And also, um, we definitely applaud you for all the uh, pre preparations you have done. Um, it's definitely uh, something that those of us who work in emergency and disaster response and preparedness, um, we always push for um, as much self preparedness as you can do in advance of anything happening. So we definitely appreciate you sharing that with us today. Thank you. Okay, we will now hear from our last panel member for this session, David Sakaria. David lives in Kapolei, Hawaii with his wife and kids. He is a financial coach and dialysis advocate in his community and serves as a peer mentor with the National Kidney Foundation Hawaii chapter. David found out that his kidneys were failing when he was 22 years old. He started dialysis in 2000 and was transplanted in 2006. He lost that kidney in 2011 and has been on in-center hemodialysis ever since. David hosts a podcast called On the Mic with Big D, where he shares inspirational stories about his life, dialysis, transplant, and mental health. He also um, is active on the Facebook Facebook page, Dialysis Discussions Uncensored, Uncensored, where he posts videos and responds to others to assist those who have questions or are in need. David? Hang on, David, you may be on mute. Give me one second and I'll help. Okay, we should be able to. There you go. Thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to, uh, to join the panel. Um, thank you for the speakers before me, and um, thank you to Rickelin for uh, letting me uh, be a part of this. It's, it's, it was, it's awesome just listening to everybody's story. Um, yeah, when COVID hit last year, it was a deep impact to everyone, especially the dialysis patients, you know, uh, where we had to wear masks. Um, I felt bad for some of my my dialysis uh, warriors, that we call them, um, because their caregivers couldn't come into the art center and bring them in. And you, what they usually do is they bring them in, they sit down, and like Brian mentioned earlier, we couldn't we couldn't talk to any of our patients through a mask. We, that's that's the only way we could communicate. And um, some of the caregivers couldn't come in, which was which was 
was sad, but it, it, it was just a protocol that uh, each center had, you know. And I, I know all the other centers had this the same protocol too. And um, right now we're dealing with a, a flood, war, um, flood warning here in Hawaii. And uh, what do you call it? Some of our some of the places got hit, like Maui, the Big Island. You know, um, the water were rising and stuff. And we just had a, a, a alert from yesterday: heavy rain. And it's been raining for three days here in Hawaii. And um, you know, you just gotta be prepared, like how each and every one said. Um, Hawaii during. Uh, October season during October and the beginning of the year around February and March is hurricane season for us. You know, um, out of my whole life, I've been in three hurricanes, but that's when I was, I had my kidneys. There was only a couple times where um, Hawaii was under alert with either tsunami or um, hurricane. And last year, we were barely lucky to avoid four hurricanes that were coming our way and just for some reason in God's grace we it missed us just like a little bit and you know it's just you got to be prepared you got to um, talk to your dietitian about what food uh, and things you need to prepare for any um, disasters that come your way you got to make sure you have the food that you need uh, water you got to make sure you got your pills and just just have it stored away for any disaster that comes your way, and you know I've I've had a lot of family and friends have been affected with for COVID, and it was it's it's heartening to you know to find out that they they're past because you couldn't go visit them or you couldn't the only way you could talk to them was either FaceTime or phone calls or have the nurses just you know. Um, hold the phone or, or or anything it's just it was hard you know it was hard and i know it's hard for everybody else um like like uh and kaylee mentioned i i do a podcast and i i talk about you know what uh what kidney disease is because i even talked to rick Lynn about I, you, you watch tv you see all the commercials about every other disease you don't have you know they don't have any commercials about kidney kidney disease so that's why we as dialysis patients we go and advocate to let people know about what ER, um, esrd is and and so on and so forth because a lot of people don't don't know what dialysis is and a lot of people don't know you know what causes you to lose your kidneys and it's just our job to go out there and and advocate for our patients and you know being a peer mentor for I think going on six years I talk to patients that are starting dialysis and are getting transplant because I've been on both sides of the spectrum I've been on dialysis for 22 years and I, I'm, I'm still um, learning uh, learning new things about um, what I can do to improve um, my way of life and living life to the fullest. You know, I, I I had a good friend that told me this. Don't let the disease define who you are. You as an individual, as a warrior, you define who you are. And I live by this model my whole life. You know, you gotta stay positive. You gotta stay focused and you gotta stay strong. And that's what we need to do because we gotta educate our community and everyone else about what we go through because like i said nobody knows what we go through but us so you know um that's just a little thing i wanted to um talk about and again thank you for um, um having me on and like i said aloha from hawaii god bless thank you so much david um Thank you for sharing your story with us today and, and for also um, agreeing to wake up so early and join us uh, <laughs> so early out there in Hawaii. No um, problem. We do want to, uh, we have about four minutes to address some of the questions that were submitted for our panel members. Uh, Rick Lynn, did we have any questions for our panel members today? 
We do, thank you. Um, the first one is, have any of you participated in online support groups for kidney patients during this time? If so, what was your experience and any recommendations for a particular online support group? Barbara speaking. I have participated with the IPRO um, um, support group for kidney patients, and it's really been a great program for people to express their fears, uh, to get ideas from other people or how they are living and coping with um, with COVID. Um, you know, just anything that people may be going through we are there to help them through that. Um, also, with my own support group online, um, we get people that really are having a hard time uh, with COVID, not being able to see their family members. And we just try to give them coping skills, um, how to stay connected through phone and Facebook and all of the social media, just anything that we can do to help them through because it's really a frightening situation for everybody. And some people can handle it better than others. So for those that are really struggling, you know, these online support groups uh, that we have, what I won't say online, we do Zoom meetings, uh, really um, uh, help a lot of people to, you know, overcome some of the uh, challenges that they're dealing with. So I would so strongly suggest that if you have the opportunity or if there's one that you can participate in, I would suggest that you do so. Thank you, Barbara. Um, any other panelists? Uh, thanks for the question, Enrique. And yeah, um, you guys know I joined, uh, like I said, uh, Facebook. They have a, a lot of, uh, um, what do you call it, support groups that are on there. And I just I just sign up and then whatever I, that's why I said I, I make videos for just to answer some of the questions that, that they have on there, especially the newcomers that are starting dialysis. So you know a lot of them are afraid and we just gotta make make them feel inspired and just get them up because you know the first thing um, when they start is they get depressed. You know they think that this is you know that. Uh, they feel, you know, you, you remember how you first felt when we were, when you started dialysis, you know, it was just scared and, 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 you know, um, trying to figure out what it was and w what is this thing? And we had to research it ourselves. So us as advocates, we, we got to go out there and, and with any support group and just to let them know that they're not alone that if they need support, that we're going to be there to help them out throughout their life. And um, like a firm believer, like, you know, we can be dialysis warriors for them. So thank you. I had um, a great experience with the support group. And um, it was helpful because it was an outlet to me. Um, I was able to express and hear other people's expression. Um, it was helpful to know that some people had the same thoughts or feelings or anxieties that I had. So every time they had the support group and um, we had did it by phone, I believe it was IPRO as well. And um, it was helpful and and I enjoyed it and it was a good outlet. Thank you all. Um, we did have a comment. This is not a question, but a comment uh, that came through. Um, they they said you are all for the, all of the panelists. Uh, you are all heroes, which we definitely agree. Um, uh, the next question was for Lisa Baxter. Uh, what are your thoughts about the best way to help patients navigate social media? Written instructions, webinar. Well, a webinar is, is a good thing, but I found that. Um, the YouTube channel was very helpful in Google, you know, because I'm not that savvy either, but I, you know, like what I say with the pandemic, I had learned a lot of those things, but I tell you the real thing is get somebody that's young in your life. The young people know everything and you can be fiddling around and boom, they, they just tell you, let's like that. And you can just forget the whole thing. I tell you, cause they, they're faster and quicker with it. So yeah, 
um, follow the instructions of it and be a part of it. And, and that'll help too as an outlet. Thank you. Um, those are great suggestions. Uh, there's one for David. Uh, for patients who live in the islands, in the Pacific and in the Atlantic, what tips do you have or what, what things should patients consider when preparing for emergencies? Um, well, main thing is uh, you talk to your, 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 your social worker and your, your dietitian. Because you, like I said, there's the disasters that happen here on the islands are unpredictable. You know, a, you don't know if it's going to be a hurricane or it's going to be a, a volcano lava thing or um, floods or, or anything. You know, it's you just got to be prepared. You got to make sure that you have all the supplies you need just in case um, there, there, anything happens. So you just got to be prepared and and make sure that uh, you're you're on point. You know, that's that's all I can say. Great. Thank you, David. Um, Keely, that was the last question. Great. Thank you so much. Um, again, I want to thank all of our uh, patient subject matter experts for joining us today. Um, it's really been truly inspirational hearing um, your stories and the work that you guys have done for the dialysis community.